Hey, Sean McElroy here, back with another one of our AutoLine exclusives. Joining me today is John Walker. He's the business development manager for EOS North America. John, thank you for joining me today. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. So for those of us who don't know much about EOS, can you give us a quick little thumbnail about what you guys do? Yeah, absolutely. So EOS has been in business for over 30 years now. We are one of the initial pioneers in the space of 3D printing. And our current focus right now is on powder bed technologies. So the raw material used in our 3D printing process is always a powder based material. And we use lasers to turn that powder into final parts. And we work in both the metal and the polymer space. And actually, interestingly enough, our first customer in the late 80s was BMW. So this second wave of the automotive industry focused on additive right now is extremely timely for us as we entered our 30th year in business and it's kind of come full circle where we are working back where we started. Yeah, so are there reasons why you went with a, a powder base? I know there's a, many different ways that you can do this. Is there a reason you guys stuck to those methods? Yeah, um, so the metal and the polymer technology each have their own nuances that make them different, but at a high level, um, we've generally found that with lasers and powder-based material, you're gonna get the best possible part quality um, out of any of the different types of 3D printing technologies that exist. And when we say 3D printing, SLS, which is the name of our plastics technology, or DMLS, which is the name of our metals technology, is one of many pieces of machinery that could be called a 3D printer. Um, so comparing us with some of the other more common um, you know, printers, maybe like an FDM machine, you're gonna see a lot less witness marks. Um, so the finished parts will have like a higher surface finish and then maybe versus like an SLA technology, which is very common as well, our parts are gonna be much more durable. And really what that lends itself to is doing the highest end prototypes. So if we think about the automotive industry, you could actually print out a dashboard, um, you know, you could wrap it with foam, you could actually put it inside a prototype or a concept car and go drive around. On our metal printers, you could actually 3D print um, an injection mold tool or a die cast tool insert and actually use it in production. Uh, and then ultimately, most people are looking at is taking that great functionality that like I mentioned earlier, with the dashboard example and figuring out applications to roll out 3D printing into direct print and use parts for the automotive industry. And anybody that's paying any sort of attention in this space has seen some pretty amazing accomplishments with 3D printing, at least someone that's not quite as involved in it like sure. myself, like examples like, uh, I think the whole front end of a Volkswagen Caddy pickup truck was printed, you know, all in little parts and then put together. Ford is doing wheel locks, both the lug nuts and the keys for them. And even recently, I think Porsche is printing the pistons for the 911 GT2 RS. I mean, just kind of, you know, that alone is just pretty amazing. What's kind of driving this, at least, you know, from my point of view, what's kind of driving this leap forward that we're seeing? Yeah, so at a high level, I think most of the applications you touched on would fall into the category of design for additive. So if we think it additive holistically, there's usually, I'd say four to five reasons that you'd wanna look at moving to additive production instead of traditional production with injection molding, CNC machining, that type of thing. So one of them could be design for additive, which enables you to use CAD design and 3D printing that can make unique structures that can only be built with 3D printing. So you create structures that are more functional that cannot be say injection molded or cast. Uh, a second main pillar is light weighting. You can use CAD design, like I mentioned with design for additive to also make structures that are much lighter weight um, because you can kind of better optimize where the mass is in the CAD software. The next one would be production on demand. You can you don't really need to forecast how many components you need to make. Um, a 3D printer is kind of agnostic in the sense that it doesn't need a dedicated tool, doesn't need a dedicated tool path. It just kind of needs to know where within its build envelope it needs to make a part. Um, so those three reasons are kind of some of the key reasons. So if we look at some of the examples you just mentioned, um, the Caddy example, that's an example about design for additive where they're making a stiffer, more functional frame, and then light weighting, it's also lighter. 
Uh, with the Ford example, that design is about design for additive in the sense you're creating a product that can only be made with 3D printing. And then the Porsche example as well would be design for additive where they're getting more functional pistons. So what's really happened um, is that the automotive industry, like I touched on earlier, was one of the earliest adopters. If we could just all think about, you know, how many prototypes are made annually, you know, just concept cars, new ideas, and knowing that the vehicle development life cycle is something about five years, we can think about all the prototypes that need to be made, and additive is a perfect fit for the prototyping side of the automotive industry. What's really happened is the aerospace industry and the medical industry have started to share some of their success stories, and that's really opened up a lot of the engineers at the big automotive OEMs to say, hmm, we see that and we probably know that aerospace is a different cost per part target or even different material requirements, but at a high level, kind of what are the best practices from that story that was just shared that we can apply to our internal, um, you know, our internal requirements. And that's where something like using light weighting to make a vehicle way less as we look at the challenge of electric vehicles. That's going to greatly allow us to increase the essentially fuel efficiency, but the battery range of those vehicles. Uh, if you look at something like Porsche, I want to maybe make the stiffest car possible so that it handles amazingly, but traditional manufacturing methods maybe limit what I can actually design. So I could look at additive manufacturing to enable me to build a stiffer car, which would then perform better. And then maybe that's something that you can market as a more premium offering or your latest and greatest type of model. Yeah, and you mentioned some of the parts like you, that you can't cast or maybe uh, machine out, uh, and they're almost they're almost artwork in their own sense. That they they come out looking like, you know, just something organic you might find in nature, which is kind of quite wild inside of uh, inside of a vehicle. I think uh, you guys were involved uh, with maybe GM and doing a seat bracket, if I remember correctly, and you know, it just had this interlocking web that was was quite amazing to see. Yeah, I mean, the seat bracket was really interesting because if, say, you worked at an automotive company and you said, hey, US, could you come visit me and maybe talk to me about where we should start with 3D printing and additive? I think a seat bracket would be about like, you know, number 10,000 of 10,000 of things that we could do just because it's such a simple prismatic part. Um, it's probably very simple, the safety requirements, uh, even though it's tied to a seatbelt, um, but it's, you know, not something like projectile kind of thing. And you'd go through all these uses and you'd realize it's, um, you know, generally with additive, you want to send us your most difficult parts, your hardest to make, your most expensive, those types of things. And the seat bracket doesn't fit that. But it's such a great example um, of what you can do with CAD software because that finished seat bracket looks nothing like the one it replaced. Um, and another one of those pillars I missed earlier uh, about why you'd want to do additive would be part consolidation. And that's really the story there is that that was eight individual pieces that eventually had to be. So if we think about those eight pieces, not only do you have the eight pieces, but then you have the eight tools that were required to make that. So then somebody has to design the finished piece, they have to design the tool, then they have to make the tool. And then once we have those eight individual pieces, we need to figure out how to assemble them, you know, whether it's welded or bolted together, then we need to test it for safety. And there's all these steps for these eight different pieces. But when we do one part, you just design one part, you build one part, and you can think about all the time that saves you on the front end with the design. And then also on the back end, um, in terms of the assembly, when you actually get a component like that into production. So I think the use case speaks for itself right there is it's just simplifying your manufacturing process. And then, oh, by the way, almost every good additive story checks two or three of those boxes. That's also lighter and it's also stronger. So if GM put that, say, in a lot of the future electric vehicles that over the last couple of months, they've announced a ton of them coming out. If they could go through every component on the vehicle, theoretically, and make all of them 20% lighter. That's really going to you know, enable them to increase the battery range, say, of their vehicles. And that's really a lot of the driving forces with AM. Yeah, I can imagine so. And you also mentioned you want people to bring you their most difficult projects, sort of. And I think... One area that I, I find really interesting about additive manufacturing is the ability to put cooling ducts into a product. And I think you've talked previously about how a supplier was doing that with a plastic piece, so they were able to mold it uh, uh, more accurately, I think, maybe. And then like with the Porsche piston, I, I think they're putting cooling all the way up into the head of the piston, 
which is probably one of the reasons they're being able to use 3D printing with a, an application like that. Yeah, exactly. So that would fall into the category of design for additive. Um, but basically, a lot of features, like if you think about an injection mold tool, they need to very temp uh, accurately regulate the temperature of that tool. So there's uh, heating lines or cooling lines um, that are usually fluids transferred through the tool that go through. And those are traditionally made with a drill. And with a drill, you basically are limited to a straight line. But if you could picture something like a door handle, there's not a single flat spot on a door handle. So you have all these round, crazy curved shapes, and then you can only put straight lines to get to them. So you're really limited how close you can put the heating or the cooling lines to the molding surface. And that really limits the functionality uh, of your tool. So with additive, you can, you're building it layer by layer. So you can put features in the middle of the part that you wouldn't be able to touch or see otherwise. So if it makes sense for your cooling line to look like a bendy straw, you could create, you know, some crazy twirling design inside your tool and wrap it near net shape to the molding surface, which would give you better temperature regulation. And then in our finished part, that's going to give us two key things. The first one is we're going to get a more accurate part because we're controlling the temperature better. Uh, you're going to get less warping um, with the finished part. So the plastic part popping off is going to be more, more dimensionally accurate. And then secondly, because we can control the heating and cooling process better, better, it actually enables us to speed up the throughput of the injection molding process. So it's pretty typical that you'd save 10, 20% in the molding process, which usually would justify the ROI to do additive. And then you're also gonna get a better quality plastic part at the end. And it's very rare that you can do something faster and a higher quality. Most of the times, if we think about engineering, that's always a trade-off. If we wanna go faster, we could generally be sacrificing part quality. And that's not really the case with um, die cast or injection mold tools that incorporate additive. And the particular use case you were speaking of um, was made by High Tech Mold locally in Detroit. And the end used product was for the GM Chevy Silverado uh, Bose speaker package. So if you upgrade and get the Bose package, the actual design of the tool uh, is the speaker grill itself. It's kind of a nicer, more premium looking speaker grill. So you know you've got the Bose, which is the higher end option there. And they're having some trouble with that. So not only did they incorporate the concept of conformal venting, or excuse me, conformal cooling, they also added conformal venting. So that tool had a lot of issues with outgassing. Um, so what they did was they put vent channels where they very uh, specifically needed to control what was happening with the gases um, that were coming out of that molding process. And they were able to evacuate them in a very precise fashion that enabled them to do a more difficult design uh, more accurately. And the big one there actually was in the maintenance of that tool. So with a lot of the tools, um, you have to put coatings on them so that the plastic doesn't stick to the tool time after time. And if you put vents in there, one of the issues you can have is cleaning them or things getting stuck in the vents over time uh, because, you know, we have molten plastic um, and coatings and such that can get stuck in small holes. With additive, they very precisely designed holes in a way that they couldn't be backfilled exactly where they needed them in the tool. So they went from having to do a regular maintenance interval on this tool to basically no maintenance at all because additive was basically able to fix the pain point of the uh, coating that was required. So that's a huge win for them because you can imagine, I don't know the exact interval on this one, but let's just say twice a week, you had to take that tool out of production and clean it out. Now you have all that time back so you can continue to run continuous production that frees up the time of your maintenance guy, um, you know, the timing, the scheduling of the injection molding itself. So there's a lot of those savings uh, with a project like that. I, I got to tell you, I just find that really cool. This, the, the whole venting and uh, ducting and not needing all these coatings. I, I don't know why, but I find that super interesting. It, it really is cool just to see the type of applications and problems that you can solve with this sort of stuff. And so I guess the best ones too, because <laughs> a lot of times like we see the Volkswagen caddy frame and that's probably one of the coolest aesthetically looking like, whoa, that does not look yeah. like any we've ever seen under the hood of a car, but it's maybe not practical. Like it's truly a lighthouse for maybe what could be, but I don't know if, you know, supercars, you know, would probably get that technology first. That still could be say a decade away. The injection molding stuff goes on today and it flies so far under the radar that we don't realize how many products um, 
we touch on a regular basis that use them. Uh, sidebar to automotive, there's a lot of um, consumer products companies getting on board with it. And I mentioned like dimensional accuracy, believe it or not, a deodorant stick is a really complicated tool to make because it's all snap fit pieces and you have the um, coil in the bottom that moves the deodorant up and down. There's a company that's doing that. Unfortunately, with NDAs, I can't share specifics, um, but they're doing deodorant stick tooling. And initially, same thing as with the speaker grill example, they did it because it was a cycle time reduction and they sell millions of sticks of deodorant a day. So 10% is a huge win, but they actually found they had less scrap rate because the plastic was so much better. And that was the huge win for them at the end of the day that justified the business case. So yeah, that's the coolest thing about molding is that it's probably one of the best kept secrets with additive where it's done more frequently. Um, and I'd say in higher risk cases, you know, like you stop an injection mold tool and that's, you know, making shots per second, all of a sudden, if that tool fails in production, all of a sudden you're now behind hundreds of thousands of pieces or millions of pieces. Additive is performing as well as traditional tooling, and in some cases, even better, you know, better durability, less maintenance, things like that. Well, and then the cool part about that is if it, it's not out there as much and people don't know about it, there's just going to be more applications to where you can use something like that. The more people find out about it and, you know, yeah, something that, you know, obviously we know for the automotive industry, there's got to be other industries too, where people go, oh geez, wow, that would work fantastic for us too. Yeah, uh, one other kind of good non-automotive tangent, um, but within the business development field, one of the other uh, market verticals I'm heavily involved in besides automotive is sports equipment. And it's kind of cool because at first, uh, it didn't feel like there's a lot of synergies, but when we look at them, most of the companies that we're working with, um, like one of our customers just won a grant from the NFL to develop a safer football helmet is they're very concerned with impact. And if we look at automotive, basically the main barrier to getting a lot of things into a vehicle is a crash test. So believe it or not, there's actually a lot of synergy because we're concerned with elongation or how durable a material is in impact testing. So it's really cool too, where there's a lot of subtle synergies um, between different verticals as well that on paper, like what does a football helmet have to do with a door handle? And it turns out they actually have kind of similar requirements at the end of the day. Yeah, very cool. So, so I wonder, what are the advancements that you're trying to make in additive manufacturing from here? Is, are you still just trying to increase maybe build size, like the build area that you're able to use? Is it speed? What kind of things are, are you looking into for the future? Yeah, so it's definitely yes um, to everything you just stated. But additive um, is at a really good parallel with the automotive industry. There's the concept of case, um, which I think is a pretty accepted term in automotive right now. Uh, case is an acronym to describe kind of the turning point that the automotive industry is at right now. So C is for connected, A is for autonomous, S is for sharing like ride sharing, and E is for electrification. So the automotive industry has these four challenges that generally speaking, it's, you know, pretty mature industry, you know, well over hundred years old, and they've never really had to think about battery range until the last five years. And it's really going to be something that's going to explode over the next 10 or 20 years. Additives coming in at just the right time where the automotive industry has a lot of new challenges to face and traditional manufacturing methods may not work for them. And that's why I think they're going to grow together hand in hand. And Really what's limiting us right now is it's always the two questions we get into are the throughput, you know, could we keep up with automotive volumes for something like that speaker grill? If we had to 3D print the speaker grill out of one of our plastic materials, instead of making the tool out of our metals, we wouldn't be able to keep up with the production volume right now. Um, so that's one of the challenges is speed. Secondly is the cost. Uh, the raw material costs with additives still are more expensive than traditional materials, but that's something that's changing every day. I've worked at EOS for about five years now. And just as a couple example, um, we have some new steels on the market that are designed more to mimic like cast like components. And they're about 50% less expensive than um, our other components and the same are aluminum. Um, we're going after cast properties now with some new build settings versus um, like rock material, and that's allowing us to build twice as fast. Um, so as I mentioned, the automotive industry has these new challenges with case, and a lot of the additive companies, ourselves included, hopefully at the forefront of it, have a lot of new things coming out to make machines faster um, and with lower cost materials. So developments like that are going to continue to speed up automotive's adoption. And then, yeah, another great example would be bigger machines. Uh, bigger machines would enable us either to get more parts per build 
for uh, smaller parts. And then if we had larger parts, I've mentioned a lot of tooling examples. Those are really limited to inserts at the moment where there's a large door panel tool, but we're just doing the speaker grill. So we 3D print the speaker grill insert and then put it into the larger door panel tool. I'm sure it'd be wonderful if we get to a point in time where machines were large enough, you could just 3D print the whole door panel tool, you know, use conformal cooling and conformal venting everywhere and get rid of a lot of the traditional manufacturing processes. Um, and some of those things are just starting um, to come on board right now, but those are definitely developments that, like I said, hopefully as the pressure to develop more case technologies comes online, additive can continue to kind of fill the gap um, between what's required and what we have today so that we grow kind of in uh, perfect parallel with each other. Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing what you're able to do today with the technology. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, kind of where it goes in the future. And, uh, you know, we've got a colleague of yours coming on, uh, coming up here in just a little bit, and we'll have a video coming out with him. And it's going to be all about how, you know, why an automaker supplier might switch over to 3D printing. And so I say stick around for that. Look out for it because we'll have that coming too. But uh, John Walker, I want to thank you for joining me today. I, I hope people have a much better idea of uh, 3D printing and kind of where it's going in the future. And uh, just really appreciate your time. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's been some uh, good discussions and always fun. Uh, not everybody gets excited about coatings and uh, vent channels, so I love your enthusiasm on the topic. So thanks very much for having us on again. Yeah, appreciate it. All right, thank you. Yeah.